good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new uh, session, which uh, will be about the, the pharma industry strategy on in health, on in health, because well, we are sure that there is a strategy, or at least we are trying to to figure out if there is. So we have three panelists from very different point of views. One company is uh, a startup and a small company that deals with the with some other big players in the pharma industry. The other panelist uh, comes from the IT sector, from Alcatel. And our third panelist is a real uh, pharma company, which is uh, Roach. So, well, we are in a bit hurry, so we start soon. Our first speaker is uh, Diego Ortega. He comes from a company, a Portuguese company called Pharma Assistant. It's a startup that was founded uh, last year. 2014, and they deal with the uh, patient treatment adherence. So, Yogo, please. Good afternoon. My name is Yoga. I'm the CEO of a startup called Farm Assistant. Um, and I would like to start by talking to you about a new uh, trend for pharmaceutical companies. So, their business model, model is now changing and they are, payment, they are paid based on the outcome of the treatments. So instead of being paid by the pills, now we start to see some initiatives where they get paid by the number of patients that really get treated. Whether it is rid of the virus or uh, increase their possibilities uh, of not being readmitted at the hospital. And this is already happening. For example, in Portugal, the Ministry of Health was able to negotiate with Gilead Sciences for the treatment of hepatitis in such a way that Gilead only gets paid if the patients in the end of the treatment get rid of the virus. So this is a new thing uh, uh, going on. And pharmaceutical industry, they are al already aware. So they are welcome with the concept of only being paid by the value that they bring. Yet there's a threat because in clinical trials, usually the medicines are effective and we have very high su success rates like 99%. But when the medicine is out in the real world, that's not really what happens most of the times. Half of the medications are not, taking, uh, are not taken as they are prescribed originally. And this already accounts to 36% in loss uh, of potential revenues for pharmace pharmaceutical companies. So this number can even increase when we talk about outcome-based uh, payment. And that makes us need to look beyond the pill. So not just develop molecules, but be sure that they are correctly used. Um, and there are some solutions in the market to tackle adherence. Uh, but they are uh, very expensive, they are hard to set up, they are basically sold directly to the patient and sometimes they cannot uh, set it up correctly. And they are centered in the, te in the technology and features but not in the patient uh, himself. We took a new approach and we made our first product that we call a smart pill box that actually is very good for the patient because it has a visual and audible alarm that alerts when it's time to take the medication so it reminds you. Uh, and it also has a versatile interior so you can have more than one uh, active principle, but they are for one specific treatment. Uh, we are not tackling right now multimorbidity, but rather if you uh, have a, a stroke, if you have a thrombosis, or you are being treated for hepatitis, you'll get this smart packaging solution that will help you to comply with the treatment. <coughs> and the, the novelty is that they can integrate with a mobile app. So by using this mobile app, we can pretty much uh, tell the patient uh, of, ab about her medication uh, intake. So you can keep track of the medication intake. And we can provide some unique features based on the context. For example, we can alert you just when you get home and near the box because we sense proximity of your smartphone. And if you are living home without the pillbox that you'll need for later or for your holidays, we can alert you right away so that you have time to go back and pick it up. It's also good for payers because they have a clear view about medication adherence. It increases the chances of a, a good outcome and we can detect missed dosages and act upon it. So interact uh, with existing telecare providers, for example. It's also compatible with blisters. So we don't need to go through specific regulations to guarantee the stability of the medication because blister packs already are certified to keep these properties. We can also collect a lot of data that is useful to different stakeholders. For example, we can know exactly when the box was open because we have an opening sensor and we can tell if the medicine was, was taken on time or not because sometimes if it's taken a, a few hours after, the efficacy is different. It's also inexpensive. So it, we can produce them pretty uh, inexpensively with readily available technology 
and it's also energy efficient. So we have a coin cell battery that lasts for about eight months. The integration is easy and simple. So we can integrate with already existing patient support programs for very expensive medicines, like the one for hepatitis. And we can provide some adherence data that we don't have uh, as for now uh, to these patient support programs so that they can act quicker and better. And we can also provide uh, some anonymous reports to pharmaceutical companies. So for the first time, they will know how their products perform in the real world. They will know how people use them uh, and get a better a view about the outcome of the overall treatment. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how did we get here and why am I talking about pharma companies instead of trying to sell these boxes directly to the consumer. I think that integration is key for the success of such technologies for mobile health and we started dealing with big players from day one. So we have been through an acceleration program by Bayer uh, called Grants for Apps. We received a grant of 50,000 euros, and we were four months in Berlin, uh, really working with them together with their experts in-house. So not trying to reinvent the wheel, but rather learn from those that really had the insights and know their business more uh, than, than we do. And that brings me to the big difference about big and small companies uh, like startups. So big, big companies lo know a lot and are used to deal with regulators, payers. Uh, they have a huge investment capacity. They know their market and their products. And they are able to retain talent more efficiently because they can provide high salaries, for example. And startups are really good at innovating, uh, at flex flexibility, the ability to adapt to new business models and to new realities uh, in the market. And they can easily disrupt a, an existing business model. They are also very good right now in attracting talent because it's, it's, it's a trend to work on a startup, so it's really easy to get some uh, pretty good talent working for us in a different environment. So how do I think the innovation ecosystem could be built, or this is already happening? We have some internal innovation inside big companies. They continue to research for molecules and uh, any other sources of internal innovation, but they also need to work with external innovation actors, like startups, for example. So they can also invest in these startups and watch them grow. And once they grow, they can integrate them inside the company and bring the innovation uh, to the internal team, even getting the talent that you can acquire uh, by uh, buying a startup. That's how I see that the things may be working, because startups need that investment capacity in order to put the products uh, out. This is our um, team of six currently. We have been through uh, some uh, very good achievements. Uh, we founded our company less than a year ago. And we have a wide range of skills that usually you will not find in a pharmaceutical company, for example, like product design, hardware, and software. Um, that brings me to uh, invite you to talk to me after. Uh, we are available for partnerships. We'll be launching a pilot really soon with a pharmaceutical company, but we want to deal with more health stakeholders and feel free to reach me if you have any other question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Diogo. Our next panelist is uh, Florence Godric Perkins. She works in uh, Alcatel Lucent, and he holds the position of international director for global government sector. Uh, she has helped to develop some multi-stakeholder programs dealing with M Health and to address diabetes in Africa. And she strongly believes that uh, cooperation and partnership between the IT companies and the pharma, it would be a good deal to foster uh, in a faster way the health uh, industry. So Florence, please. Good afternoon. Um everybody. I'm thrilled to be with you uh, to speak as, as of a subject that I'm very passionate about, so it's always a, a pleasure to be involved in a panel like this. And more specifically, the angle that we've been asked to approach on, on this panel today, which is the involvement of the pharma industry, has been something that's been, that I've been working on for the past three years because I've been convinced for a long time. I sit in a, in a telecom infrastructure company that that the pharma industry has big stakes and, and potential sort of interest in this and that this really should be done in partnership in a sort of shared investment, uh, shared value, and shared risk kind of, uh, of model. So I'm specifically happy also to be speaking about this uh, subject today. Out of curiosity, I, I would love to know in the audience, who in the audience is from the health sector or from the pharma industry? So about 10, 10, 12. 
And I'm assuming the rest of you are from the ICT world. Raise your hand from the ICT world. So there's actually people that aren't from neither. OK. Um, great. All right, thanks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by uh, just explaining in a few words uh, how our company has embarked uh, on this adventure of mobile health. I've been working on this for about four years. Uh, it's taken a little while to get where we wanted to go. We've sort of addressed it from the beginning as not wanting to do another pilot because four years ago we were already plagued by pilotitis everywhere on mobile health. So uh, as a result, it took a little while to, to sort of build up what, what we envisioned. And what we envisioned, if we can, the, am I controlling the slides? Oh, here we go, sorry. What we envisioned was, um, in fact, what, um, yes, so we embarked it more on a social innovation, shared value kind of model, which implies partnerships. Uh, and I'll exemplify that more with the project that we actually have built up. We started about, this project uh, got kicked off uh, about a year ago in Senegal. And um, I, we ended up landing in the diabetes space. It was a bit of a fluke, actually, that we did. But it turns out that it's very interesting that we have. Um, our focus has been more on emerging and developing countries. Um, we just believe that the mobile revolution, uh, in terms of the possibility of, of access um, to health and education, is going to be extremely uh, relevant uh, in those countries in particular. If you take Africa, we're expecting uh, a mobile penetration of 85% by the end of the year. And if you take the number of computers on average in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's only about 1%. So the mobile revolution truly has its significance in these countries. Um, and then if you take into account, of course, the lack of health infrastructure um, and lack of doctors, you know, in, in if you take Tanzania, there's one doctor for 50,000 persons, as opposed to France, one doctor for 300. Uh, we think that M Health is going to be just uh, a fantastic opportunity for better access to health. So, this project focuses again on diabetes. It's a multi-stakeholder partnership. We're working with ITU and WHO, and I'll, I'll, uh, I have another slide that that shows what this partnership is. Actually, ITU being the telecom arm of the United Nations, and everybody knows the WHO. We're uh, part of the partners, Sanofi, the pharma company, is also a partner on this project. And then we have NGOs. The UNFM is an NGO, which is very instrumental, actually, in this project. Bupa, which is a very large health insurance company globally. Uh, and then all the mobile operators of the country are now on board and partners of the project. And then we have the entire diabetes ecosystem of Senegal also on the project, so all of the diabetes doctors. So it's a very, very complete type of partnership. Um, it's a project we're going to be supporting for four years with the idea that after four years, the project should be self-sustainable. Um, so the private sector is also here to help to make this a long-term, large-scale impact kind of project in respect to financial sustainability. So we're looking at, there are different pillars, you know, obviously reaching the population. In Africa, there's anywhere from 50 to 90 percent of people who have diabetes who, who don't know, who are not diagnosed. So obviously mobile technology can make a di big difference with that. There's a whole education component to patients, um, both to prevent the disease, but as well better manage their disease. And a very important pillar is also the training component to health workers, um, which we'll be using. And then um, there's uh, some tools, of course, around diagnosis and tracking. What we're doing this year is simply sending, we're, it's a start small, think big, you know, incremental type of project. We're being very sort of careful on what we do when and making sure that the ecosystem is going to be ready. Um, so we're sending, for example, this year just foot wounds, you know, via mobile phones to the expert center in Dakar for sort of remote diagnosis kinds of things. Um, so our role as an ICT company in this project is, you know, we've contributed obviously with technology, with simply as the first brick, which was a software as a service platform, which is what enables you to deliver the mobile SMS messages on the phone. And we play the role a bit of an aggregator with all the mobile operators as well. Where we played a really, really important role, and this is where I believe that the strength of the partnerships really kicks in between the two worlds, is that we ensured that the Ministry of Telecom, the e-government agency of the country, and the telecom operator were going to work with the Ministry of Health on this. And this was not easy to accomplish. Ministries don't traditionally sort of work together on these things, so it really took several months to make that happen. But it's happening, and it's been extremely powerful because the snowball effect of that has been fantastic in the sense that they've created, as a result of this project, a commission, for example, to work on the M health regulation in the country. Um, so, so that's just to give you an idea. Very quickly, this is the ITU WHO NCD 
mobile health initiative I was referring to that this program is part of. Um, this uh, got kicked off at, at the, in 2012. It's a very powerful partnership. If you're not aware of it, I wanted to do a quick slide uh, on it. They're picking eight countries uh, in the world and um, helping these countries basically to implement national mobile health uh, projects around non-communicable diseases specifically. As you can see, it's a, a, a multi-stakeholder model, but as well a cross-sectoral model. There's three pharma companies that have already jumped on board this uh, partnership. I really believe it's helping to move the needle as they're establishing toolkits and evidence. Uh, I won't stay on this slide very long. This is just a very quick visual of some of the SMS messages we started sending uh, during the last Ramadan in Senegal. And this was very simple. It's to help, it was to help you know, patients basically better manage their fasting around the, the uh, Ramadan time, diabetes patients. So let's uh, move a little bit now in the role of pharma in M health. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I, I've been intrigued and fascinated and really tried to push the pharma industry, or at least the few people that I've talked to, into doing more because I felt they weren't doing enough. And when I first started talking to farmers about three or four years ago, I met a few champions. Um, and, and, you know, there were some fantastic projects already in existence. I mean, pharma have been dibbling and dabbling with this or working on it for, of course, a number of years. So there were some great things being done. But I didn't sense that there was any central strategy, coordination, you know, sort of a big, you know, sort of the, an understanding of, of the revolution that was ahead for them as well. Um, I've seen a definite shift in the last year. I'm seeing more and more sort of uh, farmers having hired now a digital ahead with a clear, you know, budget a team, uh, a mission, and, and, a, and so there's definitely, I'm very hopeful that things are about to start really sort of moving faster now because I, you know, people were very passionate in pharmas, but you could tell they just didn't have the means to, to do more. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think you know, there was a trial and error phase in the pharma industry in the last few years and that we're now moving to a more, more strategic approach, which is super encouraging. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna do, skip over maybe um, because uh, Diogo did a fantastic job I thought of presenting a little bit some of the trends also in terms of sort of what is expected now by by the health sector in terms of outcomes um, but I, I will just sort of talk just for a few minutes about the um, excuse me uh, a couple of yeah and I think Diogo made it, did a good job of describing that sort of moving beyond selling the pill these are sort of the trends kind of happening in the pharma industry um, the whole um, uh, backdrop, of course, of R&D costs for new medicines are rising. The blockbuster products that historically financed these, you know, sort of fall, have fallen off the patent cliff. Um, the growth in aging population, chronic disease, everything that we've been talking about and um, even in the last few sessions is triggering, I think, big disruption possibly for the pharma industry. So mobile health is definitely, you know, something they need to be turning to uh, to move to more patient-centric healthcare. I think big data, which was talked about earlier as well, is a huge opportunity for pharmas. Um, they can generate a lot of data with what they do, and that can really help, I think, pharmas discover new medicines, uh, improve patient care, obviously, but also have a big impact on how they manage clinical trials, which is a huge cost, of course, to, um, uh, to the pharma industry. Uh, so here is just the various sort of uh, uh, business functions of the pharma where M health can have an impact. Uh, I'm not going to stay on this slide very long uh, and because I have another one that shows actually concrete examples which is more interesting. I'll just say one thing as I just mentioned clinical trials. Um, there was a study last I think last year a couple of years ago that showed that that M health could potentially help the pharma industry save 3.7 billion dollars um, on clinical trials. Another study estimated that it would reduce clinical trials by um, half in time and half in cost. So that in itself is just hugely significant, I think, and should catch the interest of, uh, of farmers in a big way. So here are just a few categories. Um, instead of just staying large, I decided to pick some examples. So the WellDoc solution, which many of you must know because it's, it is definitely a big you know, sort of success in the medical app sort of arena, um, you know, it's just shown that it's reduced, um, uh, it's reduced um, hospitalization visits um, by 58% in A1C levels by 1.5%, and it's now being reimbursed by uh, insurance companies from $50 to $100 a month. So this is a fairly significant development that shows that farmers can really develop sort of new products and services. And you can go way beyond this particular idea, of course, you know, with the whole sensors and digital tools and the, the, the 
connectivity of devices now. There's just many, many, many possibilities ahead, I think. Diagnosing the undiagnosed, um, you know, I stay with diabetes because it's a subject I've gotten to know well, um, is, is definitely another one. You know, there's millions of people who are undiagnosed. Mobile health technology can help that. Adherence is um, a huge thing as well. 36% of revenues are estimated to be lost by pharmas um, on adherence, and there are uh, apps such as the MediSafe app that has shown adherence improvement of 86%, so that's another one. Supply chain is another really interesting one. Um, the Mozambique example um, showed that vaccine stockout problems just with simple SMS reporting reduced from 80 to 1%. Um, I'll skip over this one, but this is a good uh, little report that came out in 2013 by the IFPMA that lists 37 ML health initiatives from pharma companies. Um, here is a, a chart. It's a little bit dated. This chart is from the Research to Guidance uh, company, which does fantastic M health reports. Um, and this dates back to 2013, so it's a bit dated, but it, it makes a good point. At that point, there were 40,000 mobile health applications uh, estimated, and only 250 had been built up or developed by pharma industry, which gives you another glimpse of sort of how the pharma industry is just lagging behind a little bit, which is quite a normal phenomenon just because they're not in the um, ICT sector, so it's taken a little while longer for them to realize what's, what's, uh, what the opportunities are. Um, yeah, and, and these apps really didn't do much more than a few thousand downloads was the other thing. Here's a more uh, updated graph, uh, again from research to guidance, uh, which showed actually that M Health apps have grown tw uh, two times in the past two years. We now have 100,000 mobile health apps, actually uh, as of Q1 2014, so I'm sure there's more now. But only 82% of these apps generated more than 50,000 downloads. So there's a lot of improvements to be done in general. Uh, and this report back in 2014 showed again, or stated again, how pharma had the longest way to go in terms of the players in the space. Um, they, they, they sort of calculated that pharma apps, had da they had da been downloaded 6.6 .6 million times since 2008, but only had 1 million sort of active users back in the fall of 2014. Um, so there's a couple of things. Yeah, there's in the report it stated, for example, that many of them target health professionals and not enough consumers um, and things like that. Uh, very quickly, so yes, there's a, some of the challenges that farmers are facing is the, 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 the trust component. You know, there are many surveys that have been made and it shows that the patients are trusting the doctors and some of these websites more than they are pharmas. So this is definitely, you know, again, I make the argument for partnerships, and a lot of these challenges I think that I cite here can be addressed through more uh, cooperation and more partnerships. Um, the pharma companies are typically risk averse due to sort of how drug programs are developed, and, and, and that's having to do to manage risks. We were just talking about that uh, right before the session here. There's a big, big change of mindset that needs to happen for this disruption and this innovation to happen, and that's a very, very tough one uh, to, to make happen. The unclarity of return on investment in business models, obviously, is still a constraint. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of product orientation of a pharma is a well-known model, so it's very difficult to decide to go invest in resources on something that is yet so, so unclear. Um, and I won't stay on the other challenges, because those are challenges that are typical of M Health in general and not specific, I think, to the pharma, pharma industry. Um, so just a few recommendations. I think my biggest one is, again, this cross-sector partnership. I've seen it on the ground happening in Senegal. Uh, we're developing this project now also with Sanofi in Mexico um, and looking at other countries. I can't tell you the unbelievable impact that there is through working collectively on this, the collective impact, the collective intelligence. Um, and expertise from all fronts working on this together is, is really astounding. I really believe it's the key, uh, the, the, the way to set this partnership up is one of the keys to scaling, which is one of the big challenges of mHealth. Um, I think that too many farmers, from what I, I see here and, and read, are still focusing too much on the branding directly. Um, there needs to be a more sort of indirect approach. I think that could be much more interesting. The setting up of innovation teams who are allowed to not think only in terms of next quarter's return is absolutely fundamental because there's still an innovation incubation period that needs to happen. Um, the, getting the governments on board to me is absolutely key and essential as well for some of the reasons I cited when I spoke about the Senegal project. Um, and there you go, measurement and evaluation. I don't know how much that's been stated, but that's 
fundamental in order to sort of keep convincing people on the value of, of what mobile health can bring. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. <coughs> so we we see that uh, healthcare, we know it that is going to change dramatically the way it is delivery, the industry. We have seen that uh, entrepreneurs, the IT sector is eager to participate in that change. So. So finally, what was, was the strategy of the pharma sector? So we have, a, we have to Lars Kalhaus from uh, Roche. He works in Roche, the diagnostic care uh, for Iberia. So he will point out some, something on EAP Health. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank God I'm not from the pharma industry, uh, from the representing a diagnostics medical device company, which may sound uh, uh, semantics, but it's a huge difference, uh, actually. Um, thank you for the invitation for speaking here. Um, what I will do in the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to show you who we are, not pharma. You know that already. Um, why are we going to talk specifically about diabetes in the mHealth context? And you will notice that I will use mHealth and digital health a little bit interchangeably, uh, knowing that digital health is a much larger ecosystem. Uh, but uh, yeah, I will, I will just use both, uh, both uh, uh, words in the same way. Uh, I will show you a bit of a new approach that we're taking and also the challenges in implementation, which already have been uh, discussed by some of my uh, fellow co-speakers uh, before. So, so what are we? Basically, as Roche Diabetes Care, we're a medical device company. We're, med oops. We're a medical device company which are with our main, main brand, AccuCheck. We do um, technology and medical devices that support people in their daily management uh, of diabetes, and we're a world market uh, leader uh, in, the, in that area. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have, and this is the perspective I'm going to talk about uh, uh, more today, uh, we have uh, a company named, uh, called Eminence Healthcare Services, which is uh, basically a startup, a company, internal startup, a Spanish company owned by uh, Roche uh, Spain and 100%. And uh, what we do here is basically we pioneer in, in enabling technologies for mHealth and uh, digital health. You can imagine that's quite a schizophrenic situation of being in a traditional medical device uh, business, uh, you know, spending your... Um, your mornings trying to drive a traditional business and the afternoon trying to destroy a traditional business in order to, be, to build a new one. So you need a good level of uh, schizophrenia, I hope not pathological yet. Uh, but um, one of the main challenges in the morning is to decide, well, am I going to put on a suit or am I going to put on a shirt and, and some jeans? Um, well, why diabetes? Let's have a look at uh, a couple of numbers. And uh, uh, I've seen uh, uh, research to guidance being uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, we see uh, uh, from all the research there is out phenomenal growth uh, in the M Health market. Uh, if you look at 2014, 2015, estimated about four to six uh, billion uh, US dollars, and then with a CAGR of 61% uh, coming from 2010, 2017. So that looks phenomenal. Uh, that looks really great. But on the other hand, if you look total healthcare spending uh, in Europe, uh, we're reaching a thousand billion in total healthcare spending. So I asked myself, are these numbers too conservative? Uh, and are we looking basically at apps and current business models on paper, uh, paper use or are consumers buying them? And can't we have a bigger share uh, of the whole market uh, for mHealth or digital health? So why diabetes? Well, also again, uh, from research to guidance, basically what you see is that uh, chronic diseases are those therapeutic areas that are mostly interesting uh, for mHealth uh, solutions. And from, the, from those uh, chronic diseases, by far, diabetes is, that, is the therapeutic area that is considered the most interesting uh, for the application uh, of mHealth. What's the situation? What's the clinical situation in diabetes care? And what does it make uh, so attractive? Well, if you look at uh, today's situation, basically in Europe and all over the world, uh, in Europe, we have about 320 uh, oral antidiabetics we have 150 different insulins and insulin brands. We have uh, the GLPs, another uh, agent, and we have more than 200 medical devices uh, brands in the field uh, of diabetes care. At the same time, um, well, since the last DCCT trial uh, 20 years ago, fundamentally the outcomes in terms of diabetes 
have not really changed. Only 7% of people really do achieve their clinical outcomes. So we have to ask ourselves, all the innovation that pharma and diagnostics medical devices companies are putting into the field of diabetes, why is it not producing better results over the years? And what can M, M Health do in order to connect the dots and really make a new step uh, in this market to really provide uh, some better solutions? In terms of the cost burden, uh, I touched that before. Well, diabetes is a progressive disease, and uh, the, the costs increase uh, exponentially in the, in the turn of the disease. Uh, so uh, in Europe, we're spending about in direct costs another uh, 120 billion uh, per year just in direct costs for the treatment of diabetes. You could add another 30 to 15 percent of indirect uh, costs that are associated to that. And as the diseases progress, um, well, you see that uh, compared to the general population, it's two, six, or 24 times more expensive for a healthcare system to treat a diabetic person than to have a person without diabetes or without a disease. So the issue and the challenge should be, how can we promote he healthy living, prevention, and good health? How can we avoid disease progression and complications, which are the most important factors uh, in, that, uh, in that cost situation? And how can we find an adequate balance and tools for integrating self-management and uh, professional care? And I think this is where M Health and digital health can play a bigger role. Now, the new approach. Well, um, you all know this, those trends of quantified self, uh, people, healthy people measuring uh, their daily activities. Well, if you are a diabetic, this is nothing new for you. Uh, since the medical devices are out and self-management of blood glucose is out 30 years ago, this is daily practice uh, for diabetics to measure themselves and their vital uh, parameters. So think of today in Barcelona, uh, the diabetic population of the Barcelona area is probably generating about 400,000 data points only with their medical devices. That makes 2.8 million data points for the week you're here for the, M for the, uh, mobile, health, uh, for the mobile Congress. Now the question is what do we do with all that data and are we using that data in a way to optimize care and optimize the provision of care for the patients with diabetes. And what we're doing with Eminence is we're taking a vision and an idea that was created by Michael Porter actually, and we heard about that before, which is increasing value of uh, healthcare, which means improving health outcomes, which is basically prevention, early detection, less hospitalization, less complications, faster recovery, and so on and so forth. At a lower cost of delivering those outcomes. And how do we do that? Well, we look at clinical decision making. So how can we use the data in order to improve, uh, well, with the use of data analysis and algorithms, improve clinical decision making for individual patients? How, we can, how can we use the data to support healthcare systems and providers in terms of population management and workflow optimization in the tre treatment path of diabetes? And how can we use data in order to change behavior and enable behavior change uh, by empowering patients to take better control of their disease? The vision, well, it's access, it's equity, it's quality, and it's cost effectiveness. And in the end, it's a fundamental change in the way healthcare is provided. It's not about, it's about better health and not about more or less treatment, which is the traditional view that the healthcare system and the pharma industry has uh, in this area. Well, for that, um, we are basing ourselves with the solutions we have with Eminence on a well-published uh, concept by Ciriello in uh, Diabetes Magazines, which is the personalized diabetes management cycle. And what we're doing is we're trying to enable that cycle in a technological, in a technological way with our Eminence solution. And we see that all the different aspects and elements uh, of that solution really do provide improved outcomes at lower cost and less time spent by physicians uh, in the treatment of diabetes. You will see that uh, improved data analysis can reduce HbA1c by almost uh, one percentage point. You see that algorithms and pattern detection can save up to 90% of physicians' uh, time and at the same time improve the quality of metabolic pattern detection. And you can see that uh, the use of communication and basically telemedicine modules, you can uh, significantly uh, improve uh, the number of unscheduled visits by decreasing them and also uh, patient uh, uh, satisfaction for not having to go to the doctor waiting in line and, and things like that. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a full uh, circle with modules that support um, a well-published concept of personalized 
uh, diabetes management. At the same time, we're developing, uh, let's say, solutions for providers and healthcare systems that actually draw from the same data in order to help them manage uh, more on a population uh, management level, uh, which would mean looking at efficient consumption of resources that are being invested, priority of care, uh, which is also preventive filtering of possible complications, stock management, budget management, and all of those things, and really in order to integrate both the clinical side and also the management side um, of the disease. And also we do have apps, but I think that's not the important thing. So what are the challenges in implementation? Well, we can look at four challenges, and some of them have been addressed, the organizational, the legal, uh, the political, and the business challenges. On the business uh, side, key considerations. Well, as an industry, we have to look at globalization, we have to look at interoperability, at co-creation with partners, but also with our customers, who sometimes are public uh, uh, healthcare providers, which makes it a little bit more complicated, of integration of new pricing models. In the end, this means we have to look at a business model that is able to overcome the inherent uh, inefficiencies of current healthcare systems. From a customer side, uh, organizational considerations, uh, well, only 53% of doctors today say that Emma Health uh, really works uh, with their work and IT they have today. And on the other hand, patients and payers want to change, but only 42% of doctors, but 42% of doctors still worry Emma Health makes patients more independent. Well, I think the most efficient and cost-effective way of treating chronic diseases is making patients more independent. So we actually do need a change of mindset here. So uh, summarizing the organizational considerations, we need a process and cultural change on how care is delivered, alignment of KPIs and incentive schemes for healthcare workers, um, and the development of accept an acceptance of new study designs beyond what we know, the classical clinical evidence to assess the effectiveness of the solutions we're providing. Some legal considerations that have been addressed. Well, first of all, technology changes faster at, than the legal framework. This is always the case. Uh, data protection, patient safety, and privacy is obviously the top priority and has been taken into consideration. And we have to look at how can medical devices and the boundary between non-medical devices and non-regulated products uh, be bridged in the interoperability uh, between both of them. And especially for those systems which are public systems and which are driven by tenders, we have to look at, well, all this co-creation that we need to do with our stakeholders, what will be the contractual framework uh, under which we can do that? Uh, and uh, this, that will not be so easy uh, in a situation where you have uh, public procurement procedures uh, and tenders. Last one, the political considerations, is the willingness to engage in co-creation and overcome the classical barriers and role definitions between stakeholders. We need to collaborate, especially public administration, industry, and other partners. Uh, this means building confidence and trust between the stakeholders, and we need a coherent policy making that encourages competition and uh, centered around patient value over the entire circle of care and not fragmented aspects of the intervention within the treatment of the disease. Summing up, uh, the business potential and the welfare impact uh, of M Health or digital health could be far greater than I think is uh, classically assumed, uh, at least from research to guidance. New, technolog new technological solutions will require, but at the same time, uh, enable fundamental restructuring of the healthcare systems and co-creation and collaboration between the stakeholders will be key in the value creation process. And now I'm open for a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. So now we have some minutes to questions from the public, for the audience. But, uh, well, I will start myself. We have seen that in health health, a lot of the developments has to do with the patient's treatment, adherence. And I, I would ask you to, Diogo, what, what are the key success factors for you in order to achieve good rates of uh, adherence of, of, from the patient? I think the main factor is integration and for all the, those solutions to work, all the stakeholders need to be in sync. Uh, you cannot talk about adherence without talking about doctors, without talking about pharmaceutical companies. So everyone has a stake. And I think, for example, for technological solutions, there is a big role played by regulators, by the government, by electronic health records that are not dependent on 
the ICT sector or the uh, startups, but rather from a, a broader picture. So I think to provide uh, an efficient care from the beginning to the end, you need to look all the stakeholders and really work with all of them in sync uh, to provide uh, the better outcome for the, the, the for less cost. We have seen as well that uh, in, under the view of Florence that uh, cooperation and partnership between IT companies and, and the diagnostic sector is important. So under your view, Lars, uh, how you see the IT sector? Is a partner, is a provider, is a threat? How, you, how what would you say? Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, we, we would need to define exactly what is the IT sector. Is it uh, telecom providers? Uh, is it software companies? Uh, is it some other technological startups? Uh, so th this would need to be defined uh, first. Uh, and at the same time, I think we need to, we need to look at who wants to be what in this future, uh, which I think we're still struggling to define uh, exactly. And I think along those boundaries, you will uh, then figure out if the diagnostics, the telecom operators, the software um, companies, if we are partners or if we are competitors, or if we are both at the same time. Um, I think probably the later. If is there any question, or maybe Florence, you want to give a, an answer to, to Lars? Oh, maybe I'll just say partner is definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you probably guessed that I was going to say that if you were going to give me a word on that. No, I think, you know, I didn't, I didn't dwell on this, but I, I happen to work from the government sector, you know, part of the company. And so I work also on broadband infrastructure deployments and one of the big subjects of course is reducing the price of access to internet this is not an issue in developed countries but in developing countries um, there are many people who cannot access the internet and therefore cannot access m health and those are the people that need it the most um, in rural areas or the you know the ones that are most hit by poverty so we work on all of this stuff and we work also on e-government projects so I just want to say when you think about M health I mean it depends on which perspective you're coming from but there's an entire thing that needs to be happening around it and first of all you need to be able to connect at the right price so that's you know dealing with core infrastructure then you need the data centers but then you need ideally and this is what we're doing in Senegal now is that this project has actually triggered the possibility to speak to the government about a cloud open e-government uh, system for the country, which would then enable them to sort of build a whole e-health strategy in a super healthy manner. You know, there is the famous example of, um, it was in Uganda, I think, that the Ministry of Health about three years ago gave a moratorium to all the M health projects, because they had like 60 or 70 or 100 M health projects all over the country. None of them spoke to each other. Um, they were all scattered all over the place, and this was of no use to, you know, sort of the whole overall system. And this goes back to standardization, interoperability. So you've got to think, I mean, it's just, you know, the ecosystem, if you think of it uh, really large in terms of ICT companies, I think you were very right. What do you mean by ICT companies? Because there's a whole array, of course, of different actors, but, you know, many, many of them, I think, have a role to play, all the way from basic infrastructure all the way down to sort of software applications and development and whatnot. So, Thank you, Florence. So coming back to the entrepreneurship side and the startups, Diogo, when you have to deal with big companies, because, uh, well, you yourself, you earn a contest about the startups that was uh, funded by Bayer. So how your, is your relation with the big companies uh, in terms of develop your, your projects in, on in health? They are only good for funding or? <laughs> So right now it's pretty good. So uh, uh, we have we had been for four months uh, in 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 Bayer, inside of Bayer, and we were thinking about making things really quickly. That's how we work in in, in, in a startup. You really do a lot of iterations, do a lot of changes, and then um, work at a fast pace. And it's not possible to do the same thing in, in a pharma company. For example, if you talk right now to a project manager, maybe uh, they will get back to you in three months' time. And three months in startup time is, 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 is like three years. So we really need to, to be in sync and be uh, fair about the expectations of each side. But in the overall, uh, if you get to work together and if things work, I think the outcome will be better, of course, than if you uh, do yourself uh, your stuff without talking to them or if pharma companies uh, try to do some <coughs> things in-house that maybe they don't have the 
um, ability to adapt so quickly or to understand so so broadly as people from the outside, for example. Okay. So I guess that now we are heading to the coffee break, unless there is a question for the audience. Otherwise, thank you for coming and see you. <laughs>